Welcome everyone to lecture number six on political absolutism and the English Civil War. Now we're seeing a dramatic rise in population totals across the continent of Europe, especially after the religious wars of previous centuries finally started quieting down by the 18th century. So what we're seeing is a new generation of monarchs or kings that are having to govern not only incredibly large in size kingdoms, but increasingly they're having to govern more people. More people represents more opportunities for their subjects to challenge their rule, in other words. We need to spend a few minutes, therefore, trying to understand how a newer generation of political leaders that start to emerge in the 17th and 18th centuries are going to try and assume more absolute control over their dominions. And I use that term absolute control for a reason. I want to introduce you to a couple of ideas regarding political rule. Absolutism and the concept of divine right rule. The concept that will start to coalesce among this newer generation of leaders revolves around the notion of trying to establish absolute rule. Absolutism is the notion that a king has absolute control over their subjects, including the power of life or death. Not only that, but absolute rulers often consider themselves to be the very embodiment of their state and country. In order to claim this amount of authority, though, even the power of life or death over your subjects, uh, you better be able to prove your legitimacy to, to occupy that role. And the way many of them tried to justify having this level of incredible authority was by claiming divine right rule. Divine right rule was the claim that God authorized these leaders to rule. And because God authorized their rule, then if you begin to rebel against their rule, you are in essence also rebelling against God. And that would be considered very disrespectful. In other words, the claim is something similar to the Chinese notion of the mandate of heaven, that if you have a spiritual force or spiritual forces that have placed you in power, then the population should simply submit to that reality and not try to challenge the authority of their political leader appointed to them by the spiritual realm. And if you'll notice here on the slide, I say that these two forms of government often go hand in hand. To claim absolute authority, as I said, you need to also typically claim that you deserve that absolute authority because God or the spiritual realm has placed you in this position of responsibility. Now, why is this a new development? Why are we seeing this newer generation of political leaders claiming such unbounded authority? Well, because if we go back in time to the Middle Ages, to the feudal system, uh, there were lots of revolts. You end up seeing that the nobility in many of these feudal societies in Western Europe, the nobility would sometimes grow tired of their existing political leader. They would band together and they would simply have a military coup. They were in charge of their own armies and so in many cases they could turn those armies against their kings rather than in service of their kings. So for this newer generation of absolutist monarchs they are going to realize this. They're going to realize that they need to take control of military matters and not leave that to their nobility because if their nobility decided to overthrow them now that they no longer would have control over the military, they would, wouldn't have the means to do so, right? So absolutism involves many kings deliberately reducing the power of the nobility by beginning to fund their own private loyal armies. And how are they able to pay for these private armies? Well, I've already given you the example of the British East India Company, for example, uh, which will translate their power in the uh, Indian subcontinent to uh, tremendous economic power. 
Uh, so we're going to see after the age of exploration, many of these newer generation of kings, they now have colonial holdings, sometimes across entire oceans. And the vast wealth that will be extracted from their colonial holdings will be used for them to finance their own armies that will be loyal to them and not the nobility. So let's begin taking a look at some specific examples of absolutist and divine right rule during this period. We'll begin with the example of Prussia. If you'll take a look at the map here on the slide, you'll notice that as of its earliest stages in 1600, Prussia was a relatively small province here in the German territories. Over time, however, through sustained warfare and growth under Frederick Wilhelm I, we're going to see that they will ultimately become a major military might in this region. So speaking of Frederick William I, uh, he, there are a number of reasons why we remember him as a strong absolutist r ruler during this period over Prussia. Now one way in which he will seek to enlarge his authority is through passing a series of reforms. One of the most important reforms that Frederick Wilhelm I will, will implement is he will abolish the practice of serfdom. Now serfs were basically just a step above being slaves. They were restricted to working the land of a particular member of the nobility from generation to generation. And they were loyal, therefore, to that member of the nobility, first and foremost, because they worked his land. So by abolishing this institution of serfdom, he will deprive the nobility, known as the Junker class. You can see that here on the slide. He will deprive the Prussian nobility or the Junker class of their yearly income. They no longer have these serfs working for free for them. Um, but they will, he will also strip the loyalty of those serfs from the nobility. Now, with, in one fell swoop, as he liberates these serfs, who are they going to be loyal to now? They're going to be loyal to their king for doing that. Another way uh, Frederick William will reduce the power of the Junkers or the no noble class in the Prussian territories is he's going to increase the size of the army, which will be loyal to him. He will create a highly trained fighting force of 83,000 men. And you can see from the quotation that I have here on the slide where he's reinforcing this idea that leaders need to have their own army. He's very clear. He said a ruler is treated with no consideration if he does not have troops and means of his own. And by the time of Frederick Wilhelm I's death, we will see that this large fighting force of 83,000 men will be the third largest army in Europe after Russia and France, earning Prussia the nickname the Sparta of the North. So they will become, under his leadership, a military power and a political power to be reckoned with. And again, all of this at the expense of the nobility there. And you can see evidence of how strong they will become by looking at the map again that the territories that will be acquired by Prussia here in orange and uh, yellow within the next century or so after Frederick Wilhelm's death will turn them into a, a, an incredibly influential power broker in northern Europe. Nowhere do we see the concept of a state or country as an extension of the king's rule more clearly than the example of France under the leadership of Louis XIV. In fact, Louis XIV's rule was so strong and centralized that he called himself the Sun King. The idea being that, you can see it represented here in this symbol of the, on the gates at Versailles, the notion that like the sun, everything else revolved around him and his rule. One of his most famous sayings was, l'état c'est moi, which means I am the state. For Louis XIV, he was bent on asserting his strong will. And anyone who crossed his path or dared raise an objection would simply be eliminated. Now, much like Frederick Wilhelm I of Prussia, Louis XIV also realized that he must reduce the power of the French nobility. He, too, will spend a tremendous amount of time amassing a large fighting force that is now loyal to him and not the French nobility. He will also help to tame the nobility by, of all things, inviting them to party with him at his royal estate at Versailles. 
a famed hunting lodge that eventually grew into a massive luxurious palace. If you've ever heard the phrase, keep your friends close but your enemies closer, uh, that would be a good statement regarding Louis XIV's rule. Much like Tokugawa Ieyasu of Japan, he realized that by having the nobility literally on his doorstep, right, bringing them there and requiring attendance, that he could much more easily control them. He could flatter them. He could send his spies in to listen for any sorts of conspiracies that might be uh, being formulated by the nobility against him. Louis also sidelined the nobility by appointing commoners, people who have non-noble birth, as ministers and regional governors within his administration. He'll also assume total legal control in France as well. Before Louis XIV's reforms, the regional parlements, I want you to think about those as just local representative assemblies, many of them had the right to veto any monarchical legislation that was passed down by the king. This was meant to be a check on the king's power. Well, as I've already stated, Louis XIV doesn't feel like his authority needs to be checked or compromised in any way. So we'll see that Louis XIV will revoke the right of the local parliaments to strike down any royal decrees. We also have a national assembly in France known as the Estates General that had been meeting for several hundred years at this point. You can bet that Louis XIV is not interested in sharing power with the Estates General either. He simply refused to call the Estates General for any meetings for years and years and years, and he began independently taxing the population so that he did not have to call the Estates General to get money for his reforms. Louis did not stop with just limiting the influence of the nobility in the political system. His absolutist rule also included working on imposing religious unity on France. If you'll recall, we talked about the bitter uh, religious-based warfare that erupted in many parts of Europe as a result of the Protestant Reformation. France, for example, had uh, large numbers of Huguenots, French Protestants, that had been in direct conflict with Catholics. That is, until the Edict of Nantes was passed by a previous king in 1598, which actually granted religious freedom. So this settled things down. Well, now here we are under Louis XIV's rule in 1685, and he wants to revoke the Edict of Nantes. He is not interested in extending religious freedom to non-Catholics. So the Edict of Fontainebleau will revoke the concept of religious freedom in France, and as you might expect, almost immediately, Protestant churches and schools were destroyed. Their clergy was exiled, and their members were denied civil rights. The net result of the persecution of Protestants that was started against these Huguenots in France by Louis XIV led to more than 250,000 of them settling all over the world, some of them settling in Europe, in Prussia, for example, in England, and in Ireland. And then some landed in British North America, settling in South Carolina. Others went to uh, South Africa. Uh, you can see just a, a total uh, migration among many French Huguenots during this period to escape the death and destruction as a result of Louis's intolerant policies. Louis XIV's reign was also remarkable because he deliberately used war as a means of consolidating his power, trying to force unity through patriotism. He carried out a series of wars, for instance, to extend French rule, especially in areas along the edges of French territory. He reorganized his armies and modernized them, creating Europe's best armed and largest land fighting force of 375,000 soldiers and 60,000 sailors. Years worth of war, however, began to take its toll on France domestically. The people became very dissatisfied with the situation. They have to pay higher taxes to afford these wars. Um, you know, families are having to say goodbye to their sons, many of which are never coming back from conflict. This truly drags down the morale of the country and bankrupts um, the government over time.
By the time of his death, Louis XIV is reputed to have said on his deathbed, quote, I am going, but the state shall always remain. Well, it did, but it was deeply divided and incredibly unstable. And then ultimately what we're going to see as a result of the legacy of Louis XIV's divisive rule is the coming of the French Revolution, which we'll talk about in a future lecture. Stay tuned for part two of this lecture.